Shares for beginners. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. Diversification. I'm not a, necessarily a big fan of that, but I mean, it's accepted wisdom is to hold 15 or to 20 stocks in a portfolio, and therefore, if one has a problem, it's not going to blow the whole portfolio up. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to buy quality companies with lots of cash flow. And the third thing is to buy them cheaply because generally what happens is if something's trading on a high PE, for example, and then there's any sort of ripple in their future earnings, the discounted cash flow kicks in and down comes the stock. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. Have markets left you feeling punch drunk this year? And what's an asset write down? And how can it affect a share price? Joining me in the studio today is Tony Kyniston from QAV. G'day, Tony. Hi, Phil. Thanks for having me back again. No, thanks for coming over. It's actually great. I do so many remote interviews these days. It's actually great to do a face-to-face interview, which is, yeah, good. they're becoming rarer and rarer. Right. Tony Kyniston is a professional value investor. He developed the QAV investing checklist system that has produced impressive outperformance over the last 30 years. When he's not investing, he's obsessed with playing golf, breeding horses, reading, and spending time with friends and family. So let's go full disclosure here. The past 12 months or so has not been a great one for investing. The All Ordinaries Index is barely above the level it was in 2007. Are you feeling punch drunk? I know I am a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) And we're going to get onto that. I am too. um, I feel like, is it Rocky 2 where they go, Rocky goes for 15 rounds and ends up in a draw? That's how kind of the the market feels at the moment. We're just going up and down and best treading water. So yeah, it has been a very volatile time compared to, I guess, the last 20 or 30 years of my history. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, I just wanted to have full disclosure here because I've been using the QAV Lite portfolio system and we're also, we're selling it on the podcast as well and offering a discount code. And I started in February and now my portfolio is down 15%. And I just wanted to be upfront with listeners that it's, it's not an easy ride, is it? No, and thanks for being transparent and we try to be as well and I'm in a similar boat to what you are, mm. but that's the market. That's investing in the share market. And one of the reasons why QAV over the long term works for me is because it takes the emotion out of investing. And so I would think the worst thing you could do is being down 15% or whatever the number is and going, it's all too hard and throwing in the towel. Mm. And then you don't get the upside because the thing about share investing is it's not a straight line from the lower left to the upper right. It doesn't always go up, but in the long term, it goes up. So mm. it's it's the old adage of timing the market versus timing the market that's important. It's the difficult thing, though, isn't it? The psychology and the emotions that you feel. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's, it's these times when you do feel like throwing in the towel. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I'm not saying it's not going to get worse before it gets better, too. Who knows? I mean, if we had a crystal ball, we wouldn't need podcasts like this to talk about investing. Mm. <laughs> but we don't. And what we can do is to have a framework for investing so it can take the emotions out of investing and when we get to these situations where a we don't know what's going to happen b it looks like it's all too hard we can have a way of investing which we just follow and it can get us through these kind of tough times Mm -hmm. because that's what i found was great i didn't really have to think about emotions as i've been going through it it's Mm -hmm. like um, you just sort of follow the system Mm -hmm. and it is actually a nice way of doing it. But anyway, hard, <laughs> I know. It is, and, but that's, and, that's the market. Yeah, and as we were uh, saying about just before we started, that I had one stock that I bought one day, and then like two days later it was down <laughs> 10% or more. But you mentioned that in ordinary times, well, whatever ordinary times are, that a report like that that it came out with wouldn't have had such an impact on the share price. No, I don't think so. That's right. I think. Why I think, is that? I think investors are trigger happy at the moment. Any sort of bad news, which and there's been a couple of cases of that in the latest reports. It just triggers an oversized sell-off, I guess. There is a little bit of money that's leaving the share market overall because you can get 5% in cash in um, corporate bonds or even putting your money in the bank, you're getting 4.5% as well. So I think there are people who are saying it's all too hard on getting out. And there are also the pros who are saying, well, I don't have to stay in this company. If it delivers a bad report, I'm going to go somewhere else. And then the herd moves on. Mm. which is a bit different if the market was bullish and and going up. And in the QAV methodology, you're basically basing the numbers on whatever the latest 
report is. Correct. The latest, either half yearly or annual. And we've just come through the annual season, we have, really, yeah, haven't pretty we? Pretty much, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So we look at, again, trying to take the emotions out of things. We look at the figures that were reported. Does the company have lots of cash? Are there certain quality metrics that it meets? And then can we put buy at a reasonable price? Mm. You just mentioned interest rates. Do you believe that interest rates are what's been driving market pricing at, the, at this stage? Oh, interest rates always do drive market pricing because if you're a, a company that rents or leases space, your costs have gone up because interest rates have risen. If you're, I mean, there's inflation going on, so that's part of you know, why interest rates are rising, so that hurts other companies. So yeah, it's, it's a big thing. It's does it affect how I invest? It, indirectly, it does because it affects the economy, but directly, no. We can still find good quality companies, probably even more so in a, in a downturn like this, that have lots of cash and you can invest in for the future with them. What's the importance of having lots of cash? Well, I think the most important thing is that, uh, well, if you've got a lot of cash, you're not really being affected by interest rates, are you? Because cash is separate to borrowing. You're not paying interest to Yeah, we're looking for low, for low debt in those kinds of companies as well. It's one of the metrics we go through and look at. So yeah, cash is always king. What Warren Buffett said it more succinctly. He said he looks for companies that can raise their prices at any type of environment in the market. So that's the kind of quality company he looks for. And those kind of companies have lots of cash on their books. And it also means that they can survive through any kind of downturn. Correct. Like I, th- I think, I believe during the COVID situation, there were a lot of companies, if they had a strong balance sheet, they were able to sail through. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I'm not saying that those companies still, their share prices still won't go down, but they will recover. And of course, the time to buy them is when the share prices are down Mm -hmm. too. So that's another important metric. But getting back to the theme of interest rates, I think, as you say, the share market now or the all ordinaries is pretty much what it was in 2007 before we went into the GFC. We went into the GFC, interest rates were cut almost back to zero at some stages. And then the market went from being in the depths of despair to taking off again. And then we had COVID and there's lots of cash splashed around, probably correctly, to support the economy. And that's just sort of flowing through now and interest rates are being risen their steepest amount that I can think of, probably their steepest amount in history in terms of how quickly they've risen, and that's having a handbrake effect on the economy as well. So yeah, the interest rates are very much driving the share market and the economy, but as I said, it's the underlying and individual companies that we look at, not necessarily what the market or or interest rates are doing. So we're basing this interview on a couple of your recent podcasts Mm -hmm. because, well, let's give a plug to the podcast, the QAV Investing Podcast, Mm -hmm. which you do with Cameron Riley as well. Correct. Yeah. 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 And you were talking about Macquarie Bank and their annual report that came out recently Mm -hmm. where there's been quite a few downgrades in various areas. And one of them has been about asset write downs. Tell us about that. Okay, sure. If I did say that, I might be incorrect. I don't think there was an impairment charge taken for Macquarie Bank in its latest results. What has happened with them is that they, a part of their business is to be an early stage investor on uh, infrastructure type investments and then to watch those grow and then sell them down the track when they're worth more. And what they said was they're delaying a lot of those sales at the moment because, as we said, the market is not stepping up to buy those kinds of assets at the price Macquarie thinks they're worth. If that continues, there, there would be an impairment right down. So what that means is that I try and think of a simple example. We use an analogy called the coffee shop analogy. So if you think about a local coffee shop, and there's one up the road here, if they sell coffee at $5 a cup and they sell a certain number per year and they make a net profit of 10% on that, you can work out what that place is worth if you wanted to go along and make an offer to buy it. There'll be a certain number of years into the future you'll project that kind of cash flow for, and you do what's called a discounted cash flow back to what you want to pay for that stream of income and you'll pay a certain price for that coffee shop. Now, if McDonald's opens across the road and has a McCafe in it and it's selling coffee at $3 a cup, then the coffee shop that we bought when things were good will be worth less because they're going to have to try and match the competition across the road. So no more $5 cups of coffee. And they're also going to sell less because there's now a competitor in the market. So, you know, what may have been, I don't know, I've just picked numbers here, a million dollar investment is now worth 800000 or 700000 or whatever the number is, simply by discounting fewer cups of coffees and a lower price per coffee going out into the foreseeable future. If we were a listed company that did that, so say we're a chain of coffee shop owners, then we would have to go to the market and say, we paid a million dollars for this coffee shop, it's now worth $800,000, and we have to take what's called an impairment of our assets. The accounting rules say, if we have an asset on our balance sheet, it has to be valued correctly. 
And that's important for transparency in the market. So if you're an investor wanting to buy shares in that company, you're not over or underpaying for the assets that are on the books. They're not trying to cheat you by saying, hey, we have lots of assets that are valued at this when they're not. If you're a bank that's earning money to that company, you've got to have a fair idea of what the assets are worth before you invest. So they have to take what's called an impairment in the coffee shop case we just talked about. And that would be a couple of hundred thousand dollars because of the way bookkeeping works. That would be a cost on the profit and loss, which would reduce. So it's not on the balance sheet. The assets on the balance sheet. Yeah, but then then the impairment goes onto the profit and loss. Correct. Yeah. Oh, That's okay. I was wondering how that works. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. It's double entry bookkeeping, I guess. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you've got to do that. That's a, what's often called an abnormal. So you might see in some company reports every year, here's our underlying profit, and then there are all these abnormals. And some of those are impairment charges. And sometimes the impairment gets written back and it becomes a boost to profit because of that. And Macquarie actually had a couple of those this year where they took impairments on or what they call credit impairments and they wrote them back because they didn't need to to use them going mm. forward. So anyway, the companies are always adjusting the asset value because of that and then taking a, a write down or a write up to their profit and loss. But more importantly, I think um, that's a once off cost. So if you're doing a discounted cash flow straight away, one of the years in that cash flow is not going to have the income you thought it was. But then you say to yourself, okay, well, this coffee shop going forward is worth less. So therefore, I'm going to take that off my discounted cash flow. And then if you're an investor, you might say, hang on, this listed coffee shop chain has 50 coffee shops. How many more might be affected by McDonald's opening up in the next five years? Let's reduce the valuation on the company based on that. And suddenly, if the share price was $10, it's now $8 because all those discounted cash flows have been reduced based on the one impairment on that um, on that one asset. And Macquarie Bank, being an investment bank, has a lot of assets mm. on its books, doesn't it? Yeah, so, so I, I guess part of the bookkeeping for Macquarie Bank is that they're constantly adjusting the values of what's on their books. Yeah, so Macquarie Bank in particular has a division called Macquarie Asset Management, which is the one I outlined, where they try and get an early on infrastructure developments, provide the funding for it or put together syndicates to fund in it, and then let that grow up until it's a more mature asset and then sell it. So it's kind of a, sometimes it's called asset recycling. So they, that, that's their business model. So that, yes, they do have to make sure those assets on their books are correctly valued. Probably a, an even better example is what they call real estate investment trusts, REITs, which listeners will have encountered at some stage. That's how listed companies which own real estate trading on the ASX, but they have the same issue. Because all of their, their business is basically around property and land, they've got to keep those correctly valued. So there's a big debate going on in the investment community about the REITs that hold lots of office block accommodation or office block leases in their um, offerings, in their funds, because there hasn't been a complete return to work in the CBDs, as people will know, and therefore are the office buildings they have on their books correctly valued or not? And a lot of those office REITs at the moment are trading at a discount to what's called their NTA, their net tangible assets, so their assets, because a lot of investors are saying, look, you haven't written down those office buildings to what they're really worth now. And then, of course, the, the managers of the REIT saying, yes, we have, but they tend to trade below their NTAs and there could be some write downs coming in the future to those assets. And that's all about, it's, it's about interest rates, but also about leasing. So if I own an office building rather than a coffee shop, I've got to rent out all the floors at a certain amount per square metre, and I've got to then deduct what it costs me to borrow to buy the building, and that gives me my profit, and that's getting skinnier and skinnier for those kinds of um, operations going forward. And often these assets can turn out to be very, very good investments. I mean, yes. thinking back Macquarie Bank when they first bought Sydney Airport, mm -hmm. and I think their bid for Sydney Airport was like, I can't remember the exact figures, but it was 30 or 40% higher than the, the next underbidder. And it ended up being a bargain for them. But That's at the right. time, they were going, oh, what's Macquarie thinking? Well, yeah, and that, that was that same debate that was going on in the investment community back then. Have Macquarie overpaid? And therefore, is there an impairment coming in the future? Mm. Even though, like it was funny, you see on the front page of the Fin Review, Macquarie trumpeting the fact they paid, I don't know what it was, $500 million for Sydney Airport. It was a long time ago. And on the back <laughs> page, on the back page yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know what the number was. Yeah, yeah, something yeah. Like. On the back page, there was an analysis going, hmm, Macquarie Bank may have overpaid for this by a couple of hundred million dollars. So interesting dynamic that goes on with these assets. Yeah. So if they were writing up the value of those mm -hmm. assets... That then goes on to the profit and loss Correct. rather than the balance sheet Correct. as well. And that's a whole other issue because if you're 
a super fund or if you're a property fund or if you're a REIT, when times are good, every half you'll see their profits are going up. And that's a large driver of that is the fact that they're revaluing their properties up and that gives them a positive charge to their, their profit and loss as well. And they'd be paying tax on that profit then, I assume. Yeah, they would, yeah. Wow, okay, interesting. I hasten to add, I'm not an expert on this, on this <laughs> no, field. No, no, you, you know more about it than me. <laughs> they come across these things. I'm sure there's other accounting treatments you have to take into account with yeah, all this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, if you're a REIT, don't take any tax advice from us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll get back to the show right after this brief message. Why am I buying, holding or selling a share? If you can't answer that basic question, then you don't have a plan. The best investors are ruthless in executing their plans. I've been fortunate to meet many great investors on the podcast. Tony Kynaston is one of the best. He has a clear and systematic approach to investing that is honest, sensible and methodical. It's called QAV, quality at value. QAV now offer an excellent light plan for only $29 per month. You can follow their buy and sell recommendations and learn the ropes. And the first month is free using the promo code SFB Light. Go to qavpodcast.com.au to sign up. That's qavpodcast.com.au using the promo code SFB Light. Past performance is not a guarantee of future returns. Please read the QAV FSG and consult a financial professional before investing. I receive a small commission for services I recommend, and I only recommend services I use myself. Super is one of the most important investments you'll ever make. But how do you know if you're in the best fund for your situation? Head to lifesherpa.com.au to find out more. Life Sherpa, Australia's most affordable online financial advice. I came across this quote on Twitter from Rudy Philippek Van Dyke. Has he been on the QAV podcast? He has. He has, yeah, yeah. Hi, Rudy. Most probably not listening, but (laughs) in case, he's a fun guy. And he said, bad things happen to great companies and vice versa. It doesn't mean you are wrong or the company is bad. Not everything can be predicted or anticipated. How can you guard against these outcomes in your own portfolio? Because these are the unknowables. You're Mm, not sure about what's going to happen in the future. Oh, and definitely. That's part of the game, really, isn't it? Mm. A couple of ways. One is by holding more than one stock in your portfolio. So Diversification. Diversification. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily a big fan of that, but... I mean, the accepted wisdom is to hold 15 to 20 stocks in the portfolio. And therefore, if one has a problem, it's not going to blow the whole portfolio up. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to buy quality companies with lots of cash flow. And the third thing is to buy them cheaply because, you know, generally what happens is if something's trading on a high PE, for example, and then there's any sort of ripple in their future earnings, the discounted cash flow kicks in and down comes a stock mm. that trades on the lower PEs. But if a company is trading on a low PE, it can still go up and down, but there's not that kind of whipsaw volatility because it's not being bought and priced to perfection. So I think that's why I like value investing. It is a bit of a safeguard on these kinds of downgrades that can happen. It doesn't prevent them, but you're not sort of getting a halving in the valuation because you know the outlook dropped off for a particular high-flying company. So when you're constructing a portfolio, you're not worried about correlation in any way, are you? I'm not, no. I mean, some yeah. people do, but I don't. Some people do, yeah. What I've found over the years is that I often get concentration in my portfolio because oftentimes industry sectors go through their day in the sun and their day in the shade. So, for example, in the past, I've – and I don't construct a portfolio this way. I just buy – according to my metrics of looking for high quality companies with lots of cash flow that are reasonably valued. And then you might end up with... Then I end up with... With the correlations. Or I might end up with airlines or I might end up with banks or something like that. And you'd sort of look back after six months and go, I didn't set out to buy all those gold mine companies, but actually they've been good. (laughs) It was a good time to be in gold mining. Yeah. Mm. There was a time too recently where there were a lot of coal stocks in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Correct. And there's a lot of people who are concerned about ESG Mm. these days. You don't take that as a concern to take into account when you're constructing the portfolio or feel any qualms about investing in fossil fuel stocks? Personally, I don't. And it's 
I think one of the great things about managing your own portfolio is if you do take those things into account, you can screen them out. And I'll tell you why I don't. And full disclosure, I, used, uh, I started off my career working for Shell, the oil company. So I do have a history of being involved in that industry way before it was, there was lots of ESG <laughs> concerns. I think it's always been evil with some people, really big oil. So. But anyway, but no, my point of view is a couple of different arguments there. One is that I think it's a transition to fossil fuels. And if we... If or we transition have, away from fossil fuels? Sorry? Transition away oh, from fossil, sorry. fossil fuels. <laughs> You're yeah. right. Transition towards ESG away from fossil fuels. And in the interim, we still need to keep the lights on. So I think that's that's a thing. Interestingly enough, I think for a value investor, that sets up a, an industry nicely to be underpriced because people who don't want to invest in them for ESG reasons aren't there. And so it's like going to a house auction and you're the only bidder, right? You'll get it for a better price than if you went there and there was 10 people bidding against you. So there's a bit of that going on. But also, I don't like cutting off my nose to spite my face. So if you're an ESG investor who's selling shares in Santos or Whitehaven Coal or whatever, I'm buying them from you. I'm not putting more money into coal mining. We're trading shares between each other. So I think that's another argument for it. But but really, I think what it comes down to is I invest, first of all, to increase my wealth for me and my family. And secondarily, then if I have other concerns, then I'll, I'll look at those. And everyone has their own line in the sand. For me, it would probably be tobacco companies, but there's no listed tobacco companies in Australia. Mm. And again, this is a way of avoiding stories in investing, isn't it? Mm. Because so many people love the stories, don't they? They do. Stories and thematics, yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. My saying is if you want a story, go to a bookshop because <laughs> it's a better place to buy them. Yeah, I mean, if you're a good CEO, you've worked out the elevator pitch for your company. It's been honed and honed and honed, and it's a good story. It's designed to hook investors into it. You won't survive as a CEO if you go to an investment briefing and say, yeah, I'm not sure about the future. You've got to have a positive, upbeat speech. I mean, you're a leader of the company. You've got to be motivated the staff as well. So all those things come into play if you're a CEO. And so generally, their stories are always good. And that's not a criticism of them. That's their job. But you've got to understand that when you're investing. What sort of steps can people take to check on whether the story matches the performance? Well, I think... Or is it coming back to value investing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> look at the figures. Look at the figures, for, yeah. for one. But mm. generally, the stories are always about their forward outlooks. You know, where I'm just picking examples here. Lithium's going to be the next big boom, or blockchain's going to be the next big boom, or buy now, pay later's going to be the next big boom. And they are for a while, but they don't always last. And so you've got to look at the underlying company and work out for yourself, is, is this going to be around for a while? Does it have the cash flow to continue to service its um, obligations? Uh, all those kinds of things. And am I buying it at a reasonable price? I prefer prop calf, price to operating cash flow rather than price to earnings ratio as mm. a way of valuing a company. Why is that? I think because PE is the sort of industry standard for saying whether something's cheap or dear. But if you look at the financial statements for a company, they start with the cash flow and then they drop down to the P&L and they go to the balance sheet. And along that journey, the further away from the top that you go, there's more chance for management to influence what the bottom line number is. And we talked about one of those before. Are my assets truly valued and how do I value them? Well, that's, sometimes that's a how long's a piece of string type argument. And sometimes a company has to call in an, a separate independent valuer to look at what the value of the assets are because I could make a case for this house being worth $10 million and you could make a house case for the house being worth $20 million and it's, maybe it's worth something in between. But if we're hey, taking... Sydney, a, Sydney property hasn't gone that <laughs> out of control yet. But it? if we're taking impairment charges which affect the balance sheet, it becomes material. So, And that's just one example of how the P&L can be affected by a management decision. There's amortisation, there's depreciation, there's other impairments for bad and doubtful debts. All those kinds of things are there. And so... I like cash flow, which is at the very top, and, and the operating cash flow is simply sales less the cost of those of getting those sales, and that's a less easy number to have. Or I'm going to say manipulate, but I don't think necessarily CEOs it's un, and CFOs. Un, uncolored. It's uncolored, yeah. yeah. There's less grey area on what valuations are or what kind of impairments are needed. It's just simply, I sold as many cups of coffee this year and it cost me this much in beans and here's what my operating cash flow is. So that's what I look at. Cash is king in, in terms of valuations. Is management a metric? Is that part of the checklist? The only thing QAV? we include on management is whether the company contains what we call an owner-founder. Mm. And again, an interesting concept. 
generally, not in every case, but generally if it does, it means A, who's got skin in the game, who's running the company, and B, has got experience you probably can't hire outside because they've, they've grown up with the company. So you think of your likes of Screw Turner at, at Flight Centre, Solly Lou and all his retail investments, um, Gary Stokes in WA, Twiggy Forest. They you know have large stakes in their companies. They know the industry really well. They can see over the horizon on what's coming. All of those things work in the favour of those companies. There's a couple which maybe the founders stayed on too long or something like that, but generally that's a good metric to look for. Something I've heard about recently, someone mentioned to me the idea of lifestyle companies, that there are companies there and all of the balance sheet is basically looking after the lifestyle (laughs) of management. Now, I'm not sure how many companies on the ASX are like this or if this is a valuable critique, but maybe something worthwhile watching out for. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I haven't heard of the concept, but snouts in the trough has always been around. But generally that gets rooted out by the fund managers and, you know, someone will call them to account at at some stage anyway. Mm, Not always. If the founder's got a large shareholding and they can give two fingers to the investment community, then yeah, they can treat it like it's their own bank account. Can it also be an, an issue when they own such a large amount of the shares on issue that there's a lack of liquidity yes. because of that? Yes, and you can see that playing out in companies like WiseTech or Atlassian where the founders are selling down. Because mm. the first question you'd have to ask the founders is why are you selling out of a company if it's so good and you've built it up? And the answer is because there's pressure on them to give a bigger what's called a free float in the company. And that, that pressure can come from even just the index construction. Like you can't get into a higher level of the ASX if you don't have a certain amount of free float in the company, regardless of how big the market cap is, because you just can't buy the shares or mm. the, the big instars can't buy the shares they want in it. I didn't include any of the questions, but we've got a bit of time. Did you want to talk about Qantas? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Qantas has been good to me over the, my investment history, mm. uh, but the most recent downturn wasn't, so I had to sell it. So again, full disclosure. But yeah, um, I think it's going to come back and do well, and the prices are even more attractive than they were in the past. But sentiment's moved against it, and that's a part of what I look for. So I'd rather not buy a falling knife. I'd rather buy a climbing stair and get on at the bottom mm. when things have turned around, when things look like a Nike symbol and they're starting to go up rather, and they've been down for a long time rather than a traditional value investor will say, hey, this is cheap, I'll buy it now and hold on because I can probably make money in the 18 months you have to wait for it to bottom out and, and come back. But yeah, it's been hit by a lot of negative sentiment. Alan Joyce leaving, selling his shares before he left, not a good look. Mm. And all the problems they're having with allegations of selling tickets to flights that that had been cancelled already. There's a whole series of optics that don't look good with Qantas in the last sort of little period. They do have a new CEO, albeit she was the old CFO. So is she problem or part of the queue? Tell on that. But yeah, I mean, it's a solid company. It will face headwinds and it does have to replace its fleet. So by that, I mean the aircraft will get older and older and eventually have to be replaced. Has it it been one of the issues discussed is that they they want to do a share buyback Mm -hmm. and some managers and analysts are saying, well, perhaps that money should be better deployed buying new aircraft. Yeah, Yeah, that's a common question when any, you know someone does a share buyback is that the best use of capital so and i don't really have an opinion on that i'm not an expert on aircraft leasing mm. and i assume the ex-cfo of, of Qantas has got a good handle on it so i'd take her analysis at face value but yeah it, i think Qantas will always have a focus on it for a little while until it gets some runs on the boards and then i'll go back to business as normal is my assessment i feel a bit sorry for poor todd Sampson because he's copping so much flack because he's supposed to be the brand guy. Mm. And I know that um, there have been questions asked during the AGM about his role and Mm -hmm. why is the brand so damaged? But then you think, well, it's all been operational issues rather than, you know, nice jingles and decals on the side (laughs) of the planes. Yeah, Qantas is interesting. It's been, up until Alan Joyce, it's been generally run by a marketing person. And so it's always had the best campaigns, you know, I call Australia home, Mm. all those kinds of things. It's always been... Tugging at, the, team, tugging at the patriotic heart Yeah, strings, the marketing's you know? been mm. really it's fantastic. top, top yeah. notch and high level. And then Alan Joyce came in and whatever you think of him, he was a cost cutter. He came out of Jetstar and so he ran things operationally very tight and kept cutting costs. 
I'm not a fan of that in the CEO, even mm. though I own the shares, because I don't think you can cut your way to prosperity. So, but it did lose that. It did lose that marketing magic. And on top of that, of course, you can't be on the front page of the newspapers for bad reasons, even if you have the best marketing. It's going to affect the brand. So you're right. Todd Sampson may have been pulling his hair out on the board, but he wasn't able to convince management that they needed to not take those cost reductions. And it was a difficult time. A lot of them were taken during COVID when. Airlines were, you know, very uncertain about their future. So I kind of get it that people say, Todd, the, the marketing slip, and he can say, well, I was one voice on the board and we had to do desperate things. So, yeah, I get it. And Richard Goiter, I mean, it's a terrible way to end his career. From all reports, he's a great guy and has been a great chairman, a uh, great chair on many companies. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not, not sure I share that view. but <laughs> oh, okay. it, I'm just talking anecdotally here from the things yeah. that I've heard, but you've, you, now please tell me what you think. Oh, no, no. Again, I'm, I'm repeating things that some analysts are saying. I think he's on Santos. If you look at Santos, it's had problems. If you look at Qantas, it's had problems. The AFL has taken a long time to replace its CEO. So rather than criticise Richard Goiter, I think I'll take the ASA line, which is to say, if someone's chairing three large organisations, they're going to be overworked. And that's, that's not ideal for any person or individual or company to have. Mm. That is, it's a, it's a lot to take on really, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, from my limited experience of watching the chair of companies, it can be a full-time job just doing it for one company. Mm. So coming to the end of the interview now, we've got a couple of offers from this podcast to the QAV podcast in terms of signing up for using Tony's mm-hmm. investing methodology. So there's the full club version mm-hmm. and you can use the promo code SFB when you're signing up for that one, or there's the light version and that's SFB light. Just tell us, give us a little bit of an overview of the two and sure. just your brief. Yeah, yeah, sure. We started off with QAV, the, the full membership. The club, club, the club membership. Club yeah. membership, yeah. And, and that gives you access to receiving our buy list every week, the full length podcast, whereas we put out an abbreviated version for free. We have events from time to time you can come along to as well and talk about investing with us and with other people. So that's the club membership. And that's probably the best way to learn how to invest or understand the methodology. And then the light membership is in response to people who say, I've got a career, I'm just too busy, I can't spend time learning this way of investing, learning value investing, but I'd like to know what stocks you recommend. And so we put out on a weekly basis what we're buying and selling in our portfolio or portfolios, and we have some dummy portfolios set up to track, and then people can decide whether they want to take that recommendation or not and follow along with us. Okay, that's great. And uh, there'll be links in the show notes and the blog post as usual. Yeah, good. Tony Kyniston, thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Great to see you. And Merry Christmas. Yes, (laughs) you too. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future. 